Oh, I see. Very clever. <laughs> In camera edits. Sorta, of, kinda. Sorta, of, kinda. The camera's starting to list. Yeah, I'm. I'm trying. I'm balancing it a little bit here. So it's right. not, 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 not Kind of like it. Sort of like the remember the original Batman television series where the, they would tip the camera. What? There's a word for that. Dutch. They, Dutch angle. Dutch angle. Yeah. I'm going Dutch. That's right. That's, that was cool. Film school 101. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff Rona. I'm a composer for film and TV and games. And um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the musical life. Jeff, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to your studio. It's such an honor to sit down with you. It's good to have you have you back. <laughs> yeah, As, you know, we did an audio interview, so it's our first video interview. But uh, so I know we talked a bit about your past last time, but that was a while ago. But I'd love to kind of revisit kind of. Guess, it's still there. Your origin story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, going back, what was kind of the, the first memories you had of where music kind of entered your life, where you discovered music, and what kind of set you on this path towards film and yeah. television composing? You know, um, I've always, since I was a little kid, had a kind of a weird fascination with sound and noise, and I used to take things, you know, used to take like electronics apart and put them back together and get them to squeal and hum and sing, and... I always had a fascination with it, and then I got introduced to synthesizers and had, as a, not an epiphany at all, but mm -hmm. I had something that just felt like it was mine, something that I could put my hands on and really enjoy it. And I'd been studying a little bit of music, I played instruments, I played wood, woodwinds right. uh, growing up, um, but you know, in college I was studying photography and fine art with a bit of music as well, but that wasn't my focus at the time. But the, the, but, the image and sound thing was already, sounds like it was just, there. To some extent, <laughs> yeah, to yeah. some extent. Um, at one point, I had a switch in roommates mm -hmm. in college, and I had this roommate who was a music, a, a film soundtrack fanatic. And he had this massive collection of soundtracks. Like and <laughs> so for the first time, so I was, you know, 19 or 20. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Suddenly, I got to hear Jerry Goldsmith and Bernard yeah. Herrmann and, you know, started to hear film music. Right. And um, he went on to be one of Danny Elfman's orchestrators. Oh, wow. And uh, actually, several of my friends in, in college ended up getting into orchestration more than right, right. Uh, composing. But for me, once, once I started to get exposed to that, it, it, it resonated mm -hmm. a lot. And so I was still experimenting with sound, and I worked for a synthesizer company for a few years, and I worked for some music publishers, and I kind of honed some skills and honed some, some craft as a studio musician. Mm -hmm. But eventually, all of my clients, clients, mm -hmm. all of my sessions were on films. Wow. So now I was working with some great, some not so great composers, but I was there from the beginning because I was going to help right. develop the palette. And I knew computers, I knew sampling, kind of in the earliest days when it was still really hard. Right, right. I thought it wasn't that long ago, yeah. but <laughs> it, it used to be really hard. It wasn't just, you know, calling up patch number, you know, 312. Right. So I was doing a lot of sessions on movies, but because of the nature of having me involved, it became very intimate. That is, there would be all these meetings with me the composer, the director. Mm -hmm. I'd be there before the first note was written. I'd be there all the way through. And that was film school. That yeah. was it. That was the real opportunity I had to be in sessions, in meetings that went really well, that went really badly. Right. I started to see how composers think, how they speak, how they deal with criticism, mm -hmm. how they deal with direction, how they deal with redirection. Right. And eventually, from working with all these composers, eventually they said, look, can you ghost a cue? Can you ghost a, f a few cues? Can you, can you ghost this television show while mm -hmm. I'm doing this movie? Can you ghost this movie while I do this other movie? So that was sort of, that was film school part two, where I was, go I was a ghostwriter, which mm -hmm. meant I had none of the, I had all the responsibilities and obligations, but none of the, None of the blame. 
Right. <laughs> you know, if it went well, they got the praise. If it went really badly, they got the shit. Yeah. So that was that was pretty good for me. That was kind of kept the pressure down, but it was an opportunity, and I did that for a handful of years before I started getting my own uh, work. And I've stayed pretty steady with that ever since. Yeah. I still collaborate from time to time. Absolutely. Not uh, not a lot, but I still do a few things with Cliff Martinez. Right. And um, you just did Far Cry Four. I think worked on. Just did Far Cry last year. Yeah. So uh, we were talking. To, you just mentioned a lot of uh, the <clears throat> composers you started working with when yeah. you started your career with, and you worked with Cliff Martinez and uh, Hans Zimmer and Mark Mancini and all these. Big sure. names. Harry Gregson Williams, Harry Gregson John Williams. Powell, I mean, Basil Polidorus right. for many years. I mean, so, and you mentioned ghostwriting, and that term seems to kind of conjure up this, uh, this bad connotation like, oh, you're shoved in the closet and you don't get any of the, the, the credit and you do all the work. But it seems like you learned a lot through that process. Absolutely. And, and you get paid. Right. So, do you ever go back and kind of look at the stuff you did and go, man, I wish I got credit for that or do you never think about it never think i never it. think about it really no it wasn't wasn't mine you know <laughs> um i was just you know committing to specific uh themes and ideas or yeah sure some of them were completely mine right and there was even a few really good uh some really good films and television projects that i did that how do, doesn't have my name but that's that's fine but it's and and it seems like I mean a lot of people go through that uh, that path as well these days, um, but it seems like there's they kind of work more in the light. You know, Hans likes to give credit as much as he can, and a lot of these composers are giving credit more. So do you do you? Still it seems know, that way. It seems that way. I is don't it, know if it really is. Is ghostwriting <laughs> still a, is, is that a big? I mean, is that still part of well the process? So um, when a composer is hired to score a project of any kind right they are asked to sign a legal document right and it's it has a name it has kind of a fancy name it's called a certificate of authorship mm -hmm. and all it says is every piece of music that i wrote mm -hmm. that i put my name on i wrote it right nobody else mm -hmm. and it's a legal obligation that you didn't bring you didn't farm it out right you know what i mean right right so should somebody hire a ghostwriter and that ghostwriter steals a melody say that they do it completely unconsciously, mm -hmm. who's, you know, that ends up being the problem of the composer with their name on it. Right. But generally speaking, what that means is that composers are sort of legally obligated to not put the names of their ghostwriters on, uh, on the, on the uh, paperwork. Mm -hmm. But they do. Right. Anyway. You know, it's usually worked out. Now, some composers uh, feel a little more comfortable about it, mm -hmm. you know, that they're admitting that I didn't write this cue and I didn't write this cue because you know right. what if uh, what if that was the best cue exactly right yeah yeah so it uh, it happens right but it also it seems like that led to some big projects for you I mean you worked with Hans and, and Cliff and you got to score a traffic television series and sure and White Squall with with Ridley Scott I mean, sure I mean that was I think one of your first that was my first movie first movie I mean going first back first movie movie going back to that working with Ridley and and uh, I know Hans was involved as a producer in, in some sort, uh, you know, aspect of that. But when you had your first feature and you were the name composer, was it? Did you feel pressure? Did you feel terrified? Was it terrifying? Hundred percent terrified. I mean, how did how did you did you have to build confidence to to? Were you, I mean, were you nervous when you're presenting the music? How was that first sit down with terrifying? <laughs> terrifying, of course. Where, where, how did you take the criticism? Was there a lot of criticism? Did it take a while to No, actually, I, I dodged a few bullets. He really <laughs> liked the first couple of sketches I wrote. That's good. And uh, I love the score, by the way. It's, oh, thanks. It's amazing. Yeah. I, I appreciate that, you know? I still that scene that of them running on the mountain in the Galapagos. That yeah. first score still puts that scene in my mind. So. Oh, so. <laughs> thanks. You know, it was a very special moment uh, yeah. that I wrote that whole score in just over two weeks. Wow. With, and then flew to England to record with the London Symphony oh my God. <laughs> and bring all my synthesizers. And I stayed there for a long time. We stayed for the mix and made little tweaks all along the way. Mm -hmm. No, you know, from time to time, I think it's good to get thrown into the fire. Right. I mean, who of us is really qualified to do anything? Right. <laughs> I mean, really. You're right. I, I feel like... We all have certain skills, we all have certain talents, we all have certain abilities, but 
at some point you're never going to get further if you don't really play it unsafe. Mm-hmm. So from time to time, I've said yes to things where I thought to myself, here goes nothing. <laughs> and that hasn't changed. Right. I, I still I still do. Yeah. You know, I remember it wasn't that long ago. I was talking with um, James Newton Howard. I had a studio next door to him for a while. We used to mm-hmm. have a bit of time that we would have lunch and, and hang out. And I yeah. have such utter respect for oh, him. amazing. And he said to me, he goes, you know, I still feel like a fraud every time I start a new film. Wow. Now, if he says that, yeah. I mean, come on. But I, I completely understand this idea of, there, it's not like you get a degree in, I'm a film composer. Right. It doesn't exist. It's, yeah. not, it's not a trade. Right. It's, it's, something, it's something a lot more ephemeral. Mm-hmm. So there, there is no, you're in. <laughs> there's no you're in and there's no you're out. Mm-hmm. There is only opportunities and you either blow it or you don't blow it. Mm-hmm. You do your best not to blow it. So looking back at the time, I mean, looking back at, let's say, White Squall, your first big feature, and everything you went through on that, and looking at yourself now and everything that you've built for yourself in your career, would you have approached, would you have, or were you, are you a different composer now, I guess, than you were back then? Would you have approached things the same way? Would you have talked to Ridley the same way, or or is it complete, would it be a completely different experience with the experience that you have now? Um, it's a good question. As a composer, musically... I did the best I could. Mm-hmm. And today, when I sit down to write something, I do the best I can. Right. You know, I think what's changed between then and now is that I feel a little more confident about knowing when I've written something bad or something good. Mm-hmm. You know, I've always felt like the only difference between a quote-unquote bad composer and a quote-unquote good composer is that a good composer knows when they've written crap. And a bad composer sometimes just puts it out there and kind of waits for other people to tell them it's crap. Mm, okay. And that doesn't always work. Right. I mean, there's a difference between crap and I don't like it and I want something else. And a director has every right to say, I was thinking more romantic, I was thinking simpler, I was thinking more traditional, I was thinking more uh, adventurous. Mm-hmm. But, you know, sometimes you got to get a few bad ones out of your system and then the good one comes. Mm. So I feel like maybe I've come to for that process to be a little bit faster. So one of the, um, my favorite works that you've done, which is completely different from, I guess, your typical film work, is uh, your uh, work for the Olympics, the 2008 oh. China Olympics, uh, the Regatta Suite. Yeah. How was that experience? I mean, how, how were, were you approached to do it, or did you fight to get it? Um, and I guess, what was the context and the music that they were going to use? It was for the opening ceremony, right? Yeah. Well, it was a whole bunch of stuff, but yeah. So, I mean, when you're writing to something as iconic as the Olympics, what's the starting point? Where is the, where are you pulling from the athletic tradition? Are you pulling from human spirit? I mean, where are you looking at to get the, the notes, to start the notes coming, I guess? Yeah, well, um, so uh, the Olympics were 2008. Right. In 2006 or seven, uh, I was invited to be part of, well, there are three of us who went to China to ad- as sort of advisors as to whether or not a certain group of, of a, c- a certain orchestra could perhaps uh, be doing film scores, kind of like hmm. composers go to Eastern Europe to record scores right, there right. when the budgets are low or there's union issues. Mm-hmm. So in Beijing, there's an or- there are quite a few orchestras. They're incredibly serious about classical, Western classical music. It's one of the few Western things that has really seeped in, mm. in, in in China. So I went there for about a week to take a tour of recording studios and to hear the orchestra and just look at the, kind of look at the technical infrastructure and the musical infrastructure and give them a kind of a to-do list. So I was there. Mm-hmm. By coincidence, the conductor of the orchestra that had been asked to do the music for all of the uh, ocean events, the the sailing events, the regattas, Mm -hmm. um, happened to be in Beijing. We met, and he said that he'd been asked to do these concerts Mm -hmm. and to do the the ceremonies, but he didn't have anything to play, and he didn't know what to do. So somebody had the bright idea, let's write this this, uh, 
was it was a concert that was going to tour all through China oh, wow. the week leading up to the Olympics and then become the opening ceremony and and some other events once once they had the beginning of the games mm -hmm. so from kind of a just a happenstance meeting between me and this conductor um, I sent him some of my music. He liked it, and we talked about it. And you know what they wanted was sort of epic, right. and interestingly, very Western because they had this feeling that this was for for a lot of the world was going to be their first real view of China. Okay, yeah. As something other than this mysterious, you know, communist yeah. country right. uh, that you know is like half the world's population. Right. So. You know, from there, I just started throwing them some ideas, and they liked it, and they made requests, mostly asking for, like, some faster kind of crowd-pleasing pieces, mm -hmm. which aren't on the album. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and so I went, ba I, I went back five times in the year leading up to the opening games, wow. 888, you know, uh -huh. uh, October 8th, because... Oh, right. That's a very lucky number in, in China, so they specifically chose October 8th. Wow. And, um, you know, it was it was a lot of fun. Didn't have to write to picture, didn't have a director breathing down my neck. Yeah. Got to write something that was heartfelt, but they wanted it to be very, very big, very, very uh, spacious. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they like... So, they, they liked a big sound. So when you saw the opening ceremony with your music, was that the first time you saw it, I guess, in its, I guess because it was live, right? I actually left the two days before the opening ceremonies because the, the entire country went completely apeshit. I'm sure. And, and every hotel jacked up their prices by 10. Good Lord. And, um, <laughs> and every road was blocked. Yeah. So I, my work was done. I had no reason to be there. Right. So I got out 24 hours before all hell started. broke loose <laughs> well, but I, I got to see everything and yeah, we pure, toured yeah. we did a we did a tour of five cities with, with two combined orchestras and soloists and um they filmed it for television and they they broadcast it many 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 times mm -hmm. so it was it was a great experience you know china is the one thing i've learned about china is nothing is as it seems right and you know it was only towards the very end i'd really written that whole hour of music and then I get an email saying um, dear Mr. Rona uh, China's greatest living opera composer has been listening to your music and he has some notes <laughs> and we would like you we're not demanding that you make any changes but out of respect to the greatest composer would you go through the notes I said sure <laughs> And the notes were just terrible, horrible, <laughs> useless, throw this out, I, I hate everything. So I didn't change a thing. <laughs> but actually, the best part was meeting uh, Zhao Zheping, who was, he's sort of the Ennio Morricone of China. He's the guy who did wow. Raise the Red Lantern, Farewell My Concubine. He is really the voice of classic Chinese cinema. Wow. And easily the classiest guy in the country. He was amazing he was supportive and he was he was a great guy and his, and his son actually sort of as he was retiring his son was sort of taking over and we almost collaborated on a couple of pieces i love mm -hmm. the idea of collaborating but right. in the end i just did it here well i mean i i actually listened to that as i drove out moving out here from the east coast so it was kind of wow. scoring my journey cross country and when i was coming down I remember from in the, uh, Route 70 in the, in the mountains going to Utah. It was big. So, thank you. <laughs> wow. So let's uh, let's talk about your newest project, which is, uh, well, not newest, but a continuation of Powers, which yeah. season two premieres, as we're sitting here right now, premieres tonight. Mm. Um, it's the, you know, the first uh, episodes are available. Um, so going back to season one, when you were approached for Powers, I mean, this is, uh, it's, it's a, no different than a television show but it's i guess the format of which it's being done it's different because it's on the playstation network that's their mm -hmm. first show and everything um but just ignoring all the technical stuff of it but when you approached it it's a superhero kind of show yeah um and that's such a big thing in pop culture these days so yeah. how did you what were the first conversations that kind of came up what what, what kind of show was it going to be right. and what kind of music did it need so the thing about powers is it's produced by Sony. It's a co-production between Sony PlayStation mm -hmm. and Sony Television. Right. Sony Television knows how to make TV shows. 
PlayStation knows their audience, and right. they know their audience unbelievably well. And so they, they had a kind of a very light guiding hand throughout the process of writing the scripts and the casting mm -hmm. and the directing and the music of, of wanting to make sure that their, their, their target demographic Mm -hmm. uh, would would sort of be would feel connected to the show, so Power started off as a series of I think seven graphic novels, about in around two thousand one two thousand two, mm -hmm. through about two thousand six or seven. Uh, Brian Michael Bendis, who's like one of the top Marvel uh, writers, has written Guardians of the Galaxy and Spider Man. He wrote Jessica Jones. Right. Um, he's written. He's probably the top writer in the whole in that in the whole marvel world so um spider-man everything so this was a side project that had nothing to do with marvel and he spent 15 years trying to get it made wow so he got sony to to sign on to do it so he was not really involved in the first season last year mm -hmm. so last year we scored it a little more traditionally like a television show mm -hmm. um very electronic but with orchestral elements and uh, a small live ensemble along with kind of my core sort of signature electronics that I like to do. Right. And, um, and it went well. And, you know, the, the guy who was in charge, the guy who hired me, the showrunner, as they say, right. is the guy who did, um, it was Battlestar Galactica, and what was the sequel to that? Uh, Caprica? Caprica. Yeah. He was the main, he was a show on Caprica, and then he did Falling Skies okay. for Spielberg, and then he did Powers. So then it was a, it was a, a success, it was a, mm -hmm. enough of a hit that they just said, let's do another season of it. And then uh, Brian Michael Bendis, the creator of the show, stepped back in right. to be more involved as a writer. But I was up in, I went up to see him, he lives up in Portland, oh, okay. so we went up there and... Um, sat in Voodoo Donuts, as one does <laughs> in, uh, in uh, Portland. And he wanted to, he said that his goal for the second season was to be much truer to the original series mm -hmm. of seven books, and they're hoping that each book will be a season of the show okay. in, in a perfect world. In a perfect world so yeah. um, the second season is based on the second book, which is Solving a Murder. The, the whole thing is about solving a murder of a superhero who shouldn't, mm -hmm. who had who was invincible but somehow was was murdered so that's that's the setup but the show for the second season much darker much more organic mm -hmm. and a lot not just darker but heavier right and dark and heavier different yeah yeah you know? absolutely and in this case there was the lead character who's played by Charlotte o Copley who mm -hmm. was Starred in District Nine, District Nine. and uh, he was chappy, but you don't know because he's CG. Yeah, but Hardcore um, Henry, he was just in that, and one. he was just in Hardcore Henry. Um, the show revolved more around his sense of powerlessness, guilt, and and emptiness. He he is a shadow of him of his former self in the second season. He failed. He tried to protect. This was, you know, somebody very important to him. So the second season, we came up with a different sound. And a lot of it was to blend traditional film noir, mm. you know, right. from, from, from movies of the 40s and into the little bit into the 50s, you know. And, um, and I love those scores. Yeah. And I love, and we did our, our own twist on it. So it's partially electronic and partially not again, mm -hmm. but it's a it's a much darker, much more soulful, I think, in some ways. I mean, you know, kicking ass is kicking ass, and it's a comic book, and there's a yeah. lot of a lot of asses to be kicked. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and you know, we we did that our own way as well. But what was really gratifying about this was a chance to slow down, a chance to. Um, get into a darker deeper character analysis and as the sh as the series as the season progresses it's really all about taking this initial sensibility of of who are you when you've lost everything mm -hmm. and seeing if there's any opportunity to redeem yourself 
And when you, uh, I mean, when you approach a season, for, like season one and season two, do you kind of look at it, uh, do you, are you presented with the entire arc beforehand, so do you know where the season's ending up, or are you kind of just... No. To, you're just given one episode I never time? knew. I never really? knew what was happening. Well, no, that's not entirely true, because mm. I have the comic book. Right, so you have a sense of... The graphic novel. The graphic novel. I had the graphic novel, which actually told me what was going to happen. But would you use, would you go by that as like, okay, I, I know where it's going, but you, you could have changed something, or, you know, like, I mean, how would you, as a composer, when you're building thematic arcs or anything, is it difficult when you don't know the end point or do you just kind of try to make it work along the way or do you just treat each episode as its own no no it's all to me it's one idea Mm -hmm. but 10 facets of that idea right 10 episodes each one looking at something different about that core idea i mean i feel like you can score you can score something three way one of three ways you have the characters right which is sort of like how Star Wars is done, right? Mm-hmm. Peter and the Wolf, that kind of yeah. thing. Super character-driven. But that doesn't always work in television. Right. Uh, so then there's sort of scoring the action, you know? Suspense, tension, excitement, release, you know, bringing it down, being romantic, just going for kind of the story itself. Right. And the third way is to score the background, to score the world that you're living in, that mm-hmm. you're inhabiting. And I'm I'm always very drawn to that. Ultimately, you're doing a little bit of all three, yeah, yeah. but with something kind of leading the way, something that's the the main view of or the main method, the mm-hmm. gestalt right, of right. it. You know, so um, so I think in the first season it was more about the action than it was in the second season. The second season was more about the world. Mm-hmm of heroes and villains and p- the powerful and the powerless and the mystery then and then came the characters and then came the story and the action mm-hmm. so that was my sort of that's what it was on in my mind not yeah. that you necessarily hear it that way right but it, i mean it's interesting i'm, I'm <laughs> glad i got to peek into that <laughs> sure that process yeah. So, I mean, obviously Powers is not, I mean, we have Marvel is the big thing these days and DC yeah. Comics and, and superheroes and, and uh, I mean, Mar- um, and Powers is not your typical by the book. Um, you're definitely trying to blend the genre with uh, different things. But just what's your take on superheroes in pop culture these days? I mean, it's such a big phenomenon. I discuss it with Brian <laughs> Tyler, who compose a lot of the Marvel films. He would know. He would know, yeah. So, I mean, now you're, you're in, this, in this world and... Uh, I mean, my take personally is I see it as, you know, growing up in the 90s, we had all the action movies were terrorists and, and, and taking over the world and everything. And now since, you know, technology has brought this the reality of everything to our forefront, I feel like people are looking for more of a brighter escape, a little bit the heroes that we can count on. They don't want, they don't want to see more of that kind of darker stuff, but I mean, uh-huh. they like the gritty stuff. But that's my take. I mean, why do you think they're so popular with, with the world I mean, with people? Oh, Super well. Heroes. First of all, I mean, it's fantasy, and yeah. we all love fantasy. It's wish fulfillment. We all wish we could fly or walk through walls. Right, right. I mean, it's the same reason everybody loved Harry Potter. You know, who wouldn't want to be one of those people going to that school? Yeah. <laughs> um, and the world, you know, Marvel or any of the comic books, you know, it's, it's, it boils down complicated ideas into simple characters mm-hmm. and then creates these amazing situations you know the it's it's an amazing series of what ifs you know what if you could fly right, what if right. you could throw a hammer and you know kill 50 people <laughs> in, in one throw um so i mean i think that that doesn't i mean that's been around for quite a long time oh, you know i guess instead of you know uh shady middle easterners and soviets <laughs> you know now it's it's you know aliens and creature you know and right. and villains that sort of popped out of who knows where right um the concept is the same isn't it just uh the backstories yeah. are a little <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the backstories are a little different and yeah. i i think that's and it'll change again at some point uh, yeah i think yeah it's just a i think it, but I, I like that it speaks of our time and i think when we look back at it and I'll be like, okay. I mean, have you ever read the uh, the ori- origins of Superman of the guys, of the guy who wrote the original Superman comics, and what was going so. on in his mind? No. He was a Jewish Eastern European immigrant mm-hmm. into the United States, 
and he felt powerless and he thought about what would it be like if he could win the girl through wow. extraordinary means so oddly enough a a uh, immigrant's story becomes the or you know the the story of of one of the greatest iconic superheroes and it's right. interesting of the american way too uh, uh, and it was all about yeah it was uh, truth justice in the american way exactly you know batman didn't have that morality no he was all about morality yeah so I'm, I'm, i'll do i'm going to pull the the generic uh interview question but if you could have any superpower if you had the wishful thinking of a superpower what would it be uh, <laughs> wow! Uh, to slow down deadlines with, with with my mighty sword. What a composer answer! <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so time slowing. Okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think uh, I don't think I would do well with other superpowers. They just they'd be too distracting. I would just want to fly all day, or you know, swim. All right. So just uh, looking at the uh, the industry today. Um, is there any? Th- I mean, there's a lot of good things happening, a lot of bad things happening. Um, I mean, at any given time. But what are some things that you really love? What's going on with the film industry or film music industry, and some things that maybe you, yeah, sure. you wish could maybe change or just not a not, yeah. not, not, not good things. No, it's a good question. Um, you know, sh- things are changing a lot. Right. Uh, politically. Mm-hmm. Uh, technically. Mm-hmm. Uh, aesthetically. Um, demands are more, um, schedules are less, um, opportunities are both, there's so much more going on now. There's more, the video game world has exploded and raised the bar. Um, independent filmmaking, independent television. Now there's Amazon and Netflix and there's so many new production sources but a lot of them keep going back to the same people again and again exactly um not always there's Mm -hmm. new there's new names and new faces all the time which is great um you know there's more of a leaning now and this is a cyclical thing like a lot of things are cyclical you know Mm -hmm. whatever the hit movie was last year whatever that score was will bleed into so many more scores so you know, when Harry Potter was there up until four or five years ago, right. there was more interest in, in orchestra. And Marvel holds on to the idea of a kind of a traditional uh, orchestral concept yeah. with very light use of electronics and, mm-hmm. and sequencing. Television moving more and more kind of electronic and less melodic. Yeah. You know, ominous drones and beats and, and yeah. you know, ominous tones, as yeah. <laughs> forgetting Sarah Marshall said. And... Um, <laughs> And uh, now there's more of a leaning towards, uh, well, you know, you, you have scores being done by M83, right. Crystal Method, Daft Punk, um, Daft Punk mm-hmm. uh, po- the guys from Portishead, you know, did Ex Machina. Right. Yeah. And um, so, you know, popular music, as far as I'm concerned, pop music has been infiltrating film scores for almost 100 years. Mm-hmm. Film score started off kind of dipping into the romantic classical era. That's what was on radio. Right. Then jazz jumped in. You had, you know, uh, George Gershwin and, and, and the whole jazz era, 30s, 40s, into the 50s. Right. And you had composers bringing, bringing jazz in, you know, uh, Andre Previn doing jazz, Leonard, Elmer Bernstein and Leonard Bernstein mm-hmm. uh, bringing jazz in. There was just, and, and then into the 60s, moving to the 70s, rock started pushing its way more. You started hearing a lot of guitars and it yeah. didn't always blend very well, but right. there it was. Right. Then uh, a new wave of electronics started coming in, uh, starting in the 80s and 90s. Some of it was because synthesizers started getting cheaper for the first time mm-hmm. and more and more composers were buying them and it became an economic outlet, right. especially in television where they didn't need to hire orchestras anymore. Not just about doing the demos, but being able to just have an inexpensive but ultimately emotionally satisfying uh, palette. Right. Then back to a little bit of orchestra, and then where we are now, where first of all you can you can do a incredibly convincing orchestral score without a single 
orchestral musician getting hurt in the process. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you have uh, a sophistication of electronics that's unprecedented. You know, every composer buys, the, you know, the, the thousand big sample libraries. Exactly, yeah. It does start to make things a little homogenous. You start to hear little sounds and beats and grooves and, and little leap motifs and go, wait a minute, I've heard that. Right. And I've heard it and I've heard it and I've heard it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, th that's a, a bit of a downside. But I think in many ways, film music has never been more creative than it is right now. It's certainly never been this diverse. You've Absolutely. never had somebody like Alexander Desplat and Trent Reznor and M83 and Skrillex all doing the same profession. That's true. That yeah. never existed before. I mean, right. yes, there have been interesting, you know, unique people. And Vangelis goes back to the 70s. And, um, you know, he raised the bar for electronics, as did Hans in the 90s. Right. And um, so, you know, again, something, something happens that we hear on the radio. Right now, EDM is the big thing. So, so many elements of electronic music are creeping in to uh, film. Cliff's doing that. I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people uh, feeding off of the the tremendous interest and appreciation of a new new wave of electronic music. So, yeah. you know, yeah, it's it's eclectic. It's diverse. It's interesting. It's frustrating. Um, it's uh, it's there's it's there's it's very budget conscious. Right. Um, oh, we didn't even didn't even uh, mention Junkie XL. Yeah, Tom. You know yeah. now now we have DJs <laughs> right. getting getting into the fold, and I think he's kind of the first super successful yeah. uh, composer to come out of the DJ versus the music production world. Right. Although he'd always been producing music. Yeah. Um, so I love it. I love the fact that people are taking interesting artistic risks, and I like it sometimes when people are doing things that aren't necessarily risky but being done at a higher level than done before right so i'm fascinated by it i'm uh i'm impressed i'm inspired occasionally by some things that i hear and mm -hmm. then at the end of the day you know it's the producers and directors who go yeah that's the one i want right you know people forget that no matter what movie or tv show or video game or whatever you're watching, composer writes it, right. but somebody else approves it. Exactly. You know, it's at the end of the day, it's not a composer who decides what a score is going to be. Right. They're just going to do what they do well, right? And yeah, do it to the the satisfaction of somebody else. The filter, you know, the, somebody who functions as kind of a filter to say, it's not dark enough. It's not funny enough. Right. It's not exciting enough. It's not scary enough. It's too romantic. It's too traditional somebody else so there's there's always that invisible hand of what is also guiding film music which yeah. is not composers yeah you yes. know not that we're we're not secretaries yeah <laughs> you know i always feel like my job is to give what i do to the the people i'm working with in a way that they want it mm -hmm. but surprises them at the same time and not everybody wants a surprise right you know, we're all familiar with those uh, uh, producers and directors who become very, you know, enamored of temp music. Mm. Um, some composers are very resentful of it. I like it because it shortens every conversation you're ever going to have about <laughs> what does this scene need, right? Right. You have that wonderful thing of, well, the, the, temp, the temp actually kind of works here, mm. and then it doesn't work there. Or I'm, I'm working, I'm actually doing a film right now where the first thing the producer said was, we hate the temp, don't listen to any of it. Wow. <laughs> Trust your instincts and send it to us and we'll see how it goes. So I was given a blank slate, which is right. actually makes things go a lot slower. Wow. <laughs> but it's coming out and we're, we're, we're on real three. Are you three allowed, of five. to say what it is? It is my first Bollywood film. Oh, it is wow. An, it is an epic, huge production and it's it's actually quite dark it's a dark drama based on macbeth oh my god so it's uh, <laughs> it's 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 
pretty insane. I can't wait to hear that. That's it's not the Bollywood like with songs and right, dancing right. and you know, will he marry me and all that stuff. <laughs> it's 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 a it's a very dark, dramatic film, all done CG uh, except for the actors. It mm-hmm. was all shot on a green screen, and for oh, the wow. first month or two, we I've just been scoring to people standing in front of a piece of cardboard with an X on it. Oh, wow. But actually, today for the first time, I saw it. And it's insane. It's beautiful. Absolutely remarkable. And they're very thematic. Mm. You know, this is a this is a culture that lives entirely on theme. Yeah. So anytime I step away, it's like, it's good, but where's the theme? So this is a very thematic score. Wow. So besides, um, so we talked about your big Bollywood uh, feature. Besides that, is there anything on the horizon coming up that you're allowed to share, talk about that? Uh, I just scored a pilot, but um, shouldn't we're not going to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm doing some documentaries, which, which I, I love doing. I love, yeah. Um, I love and uh, so actually, I'm sitting on like three documentaries, and the and and the feature. Mm-hmm. I just finished a pilot, and um, there's a video game coming up. Well, I'm so glad that you're busy because it gives me stuff to to consume as a <laughs> listener. So. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I feel I'm lucky in that I get to do a lot of different things, you know. Right. We can, you know, we we find ourselves drawn to certain things. And, you know, after a while it can, act, it can get repetitive, yeah. you know. You can only do the same thing the same way so many times before you get stale. Right. Um, let alone the ideas. So it's great that and you know it's not that it's not that jumping from a game to a doc to a foreign film and I did two movies out of Brazil last year and a couple of docs I mean it, I mean it's been a really diverse last few years mm. but what's but what the real diversity is are the people people who make documentaries versus people who make games right. versus people who make films versus people who make uh, television, it's a, it's a remarkably diverse group of people, each of whom have a very different feeling about what music is mm. and what is the role of music in a documentary? What is the role of music in a game? You know, is, is it, are you telling the audience what to think and feel? Mm-hmm. Are you supposed to avoid telling an audience what to think and feel? It's, it's really interesting. And the answer is not up to me. Yeah. It's really when a filmmaker says... I want people to cry. And um, what does that mean to them? Right. So there's as much of a challenge of getting inside of a, of a story in a film or a game or a documentary as it is getting inside of the people who make that, make those projects, mm. and trying to understand what drew them to that world. Because only when I know how they feel about the story, about the situation, about the characters. Mm-hmm. Do I know what my job really is? Yeah. I think it's true of every composer. I think every yeah. composer, every composer's musical journey begins with a conversation with a person who says, well, my, my villains aren't that bad and my heroes aren't that good. Mm-hmm. There. That, that one idea is enough to launch the very the first theme you're going to write, yeah. Uh, or I just want people to sit back and enjoy. It's a it's it's a it's a roller coaster ride. Right. That's another thing. Or if somebody, like I did a documentary a few years ago uh, about the ocean. I've done. I'm doing my third, third or fourth mm-hmm. or fifth. <laughs> I seem to do a lot of things to do with water, right. salt water. <laughs> um, and the director said, look. In this film, we're going to see a lot of bad things that are happening to the, the ocean ecology. It's pretty mm-hmm. bad. But there's also so much beauty. I want people to remember, to see what it is they're going to lose. So I actually want the music to be beautiful. I want it to be uplifting. I want it to be mm-hmm. inspiring so that people understand that it's of value to not let anything bad happen. So, again, from a conversation comes a direction right you know um the very first television show i ever did by myself 
was Homicide. It was yeah. a show in the 90s Life on the with, with Barry Levinson. Baltimore. And, um, where I went to school in Baltimore. So. <laughs> Baltimore, there you yeah. go. Um, and, you know, he was great. He, he was less about characters, and he was very much about making sure that the world was, was scored. That's mm-hmm. what he wanted. And he had very specific notions, especially about what he didn't want. Mm. Um, but he also loved blues. Like, his whole record collection was all blues. <laughs> and so I said, you know, we should, we should, let's make that part of this. And he said, wow. really, do you think so? And I said, let's try it. So we kind of worked, we did this score that was ambient. Yeah. It was kind of the first ambient TV score. Right. Uh, he let me get away with absolute murder. But at the same time, we would, from time to time, integrate in these very soulful, gr- but gritty and dark, yeah. bluesy guitar, really, you know, gritty, because that ended up being um, a big thing, uh, a big element to the rest of the score, which was, you could barely tell it was music. It was so atmospheric, and samples of police sirens and radios and turned backwards and stretched and slowed down and mm-hmm. and so again it was a creative decision that came not because a director told me what to do but a director told me what was important to them wow so you know i think any good composer will tell you that part of their job is being a listener a good listener sometimes a therapist mm-hmm. you know <laughs> It's, a, it's an intimate relationship, and sometimes it's easy, and sometimes it's not, and sometimes it's uh, very loving, and sometimes it absolutely isn't. And, you know, people, people on these films, p- people on projects in general, are on their best and worst behavior, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, I come on to a movie, and I'll spend a month or two on it, but the people who produce that movie may have been working on it for 20 years, yeah. getting it funded getting it written and rewritten and getting it cast, it can take 10, 15, 20 years for, I mean, a lot of big movies have been around, the screenplays have been around, and people are, you know, rattling their their sabers saying, come, let's make this movie. So think about the emotional investment that they have, let alone the financial investment, of 5, 10, 15 plus years. Mm -hmm. And then I show up in the last (laughs) 10 seconds of 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 the show. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's something that every composer is is every good composer is keenly aware of that their job is to write music, but in a really specific environment. Right. And that environment is all about communication. And sometimes it's like I've written something, I don't know if you're going to like it. Can I play it for you and see what you think? And there you go. And sometimes it's taking criticism and um having a thick enough skin to say i'm not going to take this personally right i've written something i poured my heart into it i liked it or i wouldn't have written it right i certainly wouldn't have played it for them yeah i mean that's one it's one thing to write it's another thing to actually play it back for (laughs) for a a director or producer but you know you do what you think is right and if they said no you got it all wrong you go okay thank you for your honesty let me come back tomorrow wow and that's that's the nature of of what we do it's it's a it's a conversation at the end of which is a score yeah (laughs) and your work i mean just looking at your work from my point of view i I think that's just hearing you speak about all that you you have you have a voice as a composer but every one of your projects has been so different and I, i find that you've never painted yourself into a corner into like a Tr- oh, that's good to know. I, yeah, so. I worry about that sometimes. <laughs> I, I think, oh, God, I've used that sound before. I've used that lick before. Well, but, exactly. Uh, that's part of your voices as an auteur, I think. So that's, uh, I think that's a good thing. I appreciate that. You know, I think the best compliment I've gotten is that is when a few people have said to me, you know, I can recognize your work. Exactly. And I don't have any idea what they mean. Right. But I, you know, I well, choose yeah. to believe them. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeff, I want to uh, thank you so much for your time. Kaya, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I've been really so appreciate it. So I really appreciate it. Very good.